This is a short video about Lipschitz functions on a domain. So usual setup, let's say that you've got some subset of the real line. Let's say that you've got a function whose domain is that subset A of the real line. So if there exists some number K that's positive, so I'm not saying K is like a natural number, just any real number K, such that the following happens. For every point X, Y that's in the domain of your function, the uh, outputs or the difference in the outputs are always bounded above by that k times the difference in the inputs and we'll say that f is a Lipschitz function on a. So whenever the difference in the outputs again is bounded above by that single constant k, that same constant has to work for every pair x, y, k times the difference of x minus y or the difference of x and y in absolute value, then we'll say that f is Lipschitz. And that can be a little bit confusing to think about like, oh, what does that even mean? How do I wrap my head around that? And uh, if you think about rearranging this, what if you divided by absolute value of x minus y over to the left side? Well, then you'd have what's in red down here. And that looks familiar. That looks like some kind of a slope. And so what we're saying is uh, the, we have a Lipschitz function whenever the following happens. If there exists, again, some k such that, again, for any two points in your domain, in red, that's the slope of the line from the point x comma f of x to y comma f of y, if that's always bounded above by that k. So the slope of those lines between two points on your graph can never get above k. If there exists such a k, then your function's Lipschitz. It's a little bit easier to think about. I've got a couple pictures for you. So uh, this fella here, the yellow graph, that would be a Lipschitz function. And so I just picked two points, x and y, in my domain, and I plotted uh, what's their corresponding actual ordered pairs on the graph. Uh, what I'm trying to say is if you think about all the ways that I could connect two points, such as that blue line, the slope of that line never gets too crazy, it never gets too big, and it never gets, uh, I guess, too big pointing upwards or too big pointing downwards. So it's bounded. So that's a good Lipschitz function. On the other hand, if you think about this one, this one's a little bit harder to see why it's not Lipschitz, but uh, let me actually just try to convince you of it right now. So what if you were to pick one of your points to be what looks like the origin here? I'll call that in red. And uh, I'll pick my next point to be, let's say, I should get a different color, shouldn't I? How about, I don't know, blue. Let's say this point here. So if I think about the line that connects through both of those points, uh, it looks like this fella. So what if I took that blue point though to get a little bit closer to the red point? So what if I get a different color here? I don't know, how about brown? That sounds cool. So what if I try to get even closer to the red point? Let's say right here. Now when I connect the line to the red and the brown point, uh, what I'm trying to, uh, I guess, that would look like this. Oh, it's a little bit curvy, sorry about that. How about that? So if you compare these two, the yellow line has a bigger slope than the pink line. And so what I want you to think about is, well, the closer my kind of right point, the blue point, the brown point, the closer I drag that to the red point, the more steep this line is. So therefore, the slope of these lines on A, it's not bounded. So that's why it's not Lipschitz. There is no such K where, again, the slope of the line between two points on your graph is bounded above by K in this picture down here. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So let me get rid of some of these. So what's the first thing we wanna do? Why am I talking about this? If you've been watching videos I've made about uniform continuity, well, here's the main idea is if you've got a Lipschitz function, then it's also uniformly continuous on your domain. And so how would the proof of this go? So I'll do this kind of scratch work in green. I think it's always good to kind of see um, before you jump into like a formal proof, what are you doing? So what do we wanna show? I wanna show something's uniformly continuous on A. So remember, given epsilon greater than zero, I wanna find a delta that only depends on epsilon. So delta needs to work for any two points I pick in my domain, such that whenever my two points in my domain are within delta of each other, then the outputs are within epsilon of each other. Now, what do we usually do? Well, we usually start here and work backwards and try to get a relationship between an epsilon and a delta. In other words, we try to play with this and see if we can make it smaller than something times absolute value of x minus y. So we'll start there, but what do I know? I get to assume that f is Lipschitz on this domain. So I can say that there exists some number k that makes the difference in the outputs less than or equal to k times the difference in the inputs in absolute value. And again, that's because f is Lipschitz. But uh, so what do I want to do? Why is this great? Well, because I've got the difference in the outputs is somehow related to the difference in the inputs. Why don't I just make this less than epsilon over k? 
think about plugging in epsilon over k right here, you see the k's would cancel, and you'd have all your stuff is less than epsilon, which is what you want. So let's put it all together. What's the proof look like? Let epsilon be bigger than zero. Since f is Lipschitz on this domain, I know that there exists some number k such that for every two points x, y in your, that should be an a down there, sorry about that, a, uh, what should happen? We should have that the, uh, again, the difference in the outputs is less than k times the difference in the inputs in absolute value. And so why don't we just choose delta to be epsilon over that special k, that special k that comes from the fact that f is Lipschitz on here. Uh, so then what do we know then? Well, if x minus y in absolute value is less than delta, I'm just gonna plug that information in up here. So just to repeat it, so if x minus y in absolute value is less than delta, then the difference in the outputs in absolute value is still less than k times uh, x minus y, which is just less than k times epsilon over k, and the k's cancel and you get epsilon. By the way, I think when I wrote this up here, this should probably just be just less than k. I mean, you could find k big enough to make this strictly less than k, so change that to a less than k. Okay, so what I wanna do is to remind you about how do these, all these different types of functions relate to each other. So we've kinda of got a hierarchy of functions, just like you've got a hierarchy in the real numbers, where like the integers are contained in the rationals, which are all contained in the real numbers. We can think about these sets of functions as well. So if I think about the set of all functions on A, so far what do I know? Well, I know there's such a thing as the continuous functions on A. And so like this kind of space in between, those are functions on A that are not continuous. Whereas if you're in here, those are the continuous functions on A. Now what else do I know? I know that there are such a thing as the uniformly continuous functions on A. So again, how should you look at my picture? If you're a function that's uniformly continuous, well, you're also in that blue circle, so it's continuous as well. And what did we just prove? Well, the above just proved that uh, if you are Lipschitz, then you are uniformly continuous. So what does that suggest? That suggests that there are some functions that are uniformly continuous, but not Lipschitz. In other words, maybe it's kind of harder to be a Lipschitz function than it is to be a uniformly continuous function. Maybe this Lipschitz property is pretty strong. So what I wanna show you is just an example of that. So uniformly continuous does not imply Lipschitz. So in other words, there are functions that live maybe in this space right here that are uniformly continuous, but not Lipschitz. So to give you an example, it's a surprisingly nice function on a surprisingly nice domain. So the domain is from zero to two, and the function is square root of x. And so I know that f's continuous on zero two. And also since this is a closed bounded interval, we had a result that said, well, continuous functions on closed bounded intervals are in fact uniformly continuous. So I've definitely got a function that's uniformly continuous, but now we'll show that f is not Lipschitz on this domain a zero two. So given any positive number k, let's take x to be in the interval from zero to one over k squared. So in that open interval there. So in particular, if x is in that interval, I'm just trying to say it's definitely less than one over k squared. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna manipulate that. If I solve that for k, that says that one over square root of x is bigger than or equal to k. Uh, I guess maybe I could take the equals away. Sorry about that. So what are we gonna do? I'm gonna apply this. I'm gonna try to show you in a minute how this relates to my Lipschitz condition. So what if I look at kind of the slope of the line between the two points on the graph of f of x equals square root of x up here that connects uh, when the input's x and when the input's zero. So that's the slope of those two points on my graph. And so in other words, if I scroll back up, and I'll scroll back down in a minute, so close your eyes if you get motion sick, what I'm trying to say is if I said this is x, I'm gonna look at the slope of the line between these two points right here and that's what is going on in absolute value downstairs here. And oh, by the way, that picture is this example down here. Uh, what if you started simplifying that? Well, in the top, this would be square root of x minus square root of zero, so just square root of x. And in the bottom, it's just x minus zero, so x. So that's one over the square root of x. But uh, aha, remember, one over the square root of x is larger than or equal to k since I chose x to be to the left of one over k squared. So this was the point of all this algebraic manipulation up here was to get to this step. And if you think about what does this say, well this says that the slope of that line between those two points on your graph is bigger than that k. So think about this, for any positive number k, I could always cookie up an x so that the slope of the uh, line between the two points on the graph is bigger than that k. 
So the slope of that line is, is, so the slope of all those lines, maybe think about that, is never bounded. And so again, what have I said? I said for all positive numbers k, we could always find an x, and we'll just take that y to be zero, such that, again, the slope of the line between the two points on your graph, whose input is x and whose input is zero, is larger than whatever k that you picked. Thus, f is not a Lipschitz function on a.